as you're getting oriented to Ecclesiastes, and just help you out a little bit, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, right? Song of Songs. Psalms is kind of in the middle. Go to Proverbs and then followed by Ecclesiastes. It is an unnerving thing when you're reading through commentaries on a particular book and professors in seminary say, this is the strangest, hardest, and most perplexing book I have ever come across in all the scriptures. More than one commentary opened in a similar way. So I think the wisest thing for us to do would be to begin by asking God to help us as we walk through this glorious book. Would you pray with me? Father, with humility, but with full confidence, we bow before your word and ask that you would now lead us under the direction of the Holy Spirit we pray that you would, he would minister to us. He would care for our souls and bring conviction and encouragement. And that he would accomplish whatever it is that you desire that would be accomplished this morning. We pray that and are confident in the fact that his ministry will involve revealing the glory of Jesus Christ. And so to that end, we ask you to help us now and to lead us as we ask it in Jesus' incomparable name. Amen. From books to movies to social media, from getaway vacations to fantasy football to virtual reality, We live in this world with a tension between the way that we would like things to be and the way things in this life actually are. The book of Ecclesiastes brings us face to face with reality, with the way life often is. It makes declarations, and it asks many questions. But ultimately, this book points us to the one place all of the answers can be found. This book is a lot like life, in that despite what it feels like, as we walk through it, it can only be truly understood in light of the end. In fact, David Gibson described the message of Ecclesiastes as teaching us to live life backwards. Now, it wouldn't make a lot of sense if I preached through Ecclesiastes backwards, but I do believe that in order to rightly understand the book, we need to think through the observations that are made in light of the author's final conclusion. So, Turn with me to the very end of the book, chapter 12, verses 11 through 14. This is where the author or the preacher is directing us. The words of the wise are like goads. And like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings. They are given by one shepherd. My son, beware of anything beyond these. Of making many books there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. Thus ends the book of Ecclesiastes. But this morning, we need to start at the beginning. 
Our passage this morning includes the first two verses of this wonderful book. Hear the words of our glorious God. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. In between services, Dan Taylor told me that this was the very text under which he was converted to Christ. He was at a football camp and some big, huge football guy, uh, we have one of those who preaches here sometimes, said to him in this text, he opened with soap bubbles, soap bubbles, everything is soap bubbles. And he proceeded to unpack this text and Dan broke down and wept and Christ converted him with this very text. How glorious. Now I have two main goals this morning. Taken together, I fully admit, it's rather ambitious. But goal one is to tackle the key issues we need to discuss in order to understand this book clearly. And second, through this process, to see the glory of Jesus unveiled and in so doing, prepare our hearts to receive communion with great joy this morning together. So let's begin with a very fair question. Why Ecclesiastes? Why study Ecclesiastes? Now, there are a number of valid reasons, but I want to begin with where I left off at the end of the Great Commission from the Gospel of Matthew. Ladies, if you missed the capstone message from that event because you were at the retreat last weekend. We we post all of them on our website, all of our messages, and you can access them on iTunes as well. One of the ways we as a church seek to make disciples is through teaching all that Jesus has commanded, teaching others to observe all that Jesus has commanded. That's straight out of the Great Commission, straight out of the end of Matthew's gospel. Therefore, that's the reason why we preach through the Bible and particular books expositionally. Lord willing, we will preach through each book, every passage, eventually. All right? That little Jaslyn, I was talking with her before church this morning, she said, what happens when you finish preaching through the whole Bible? Do you just start over? And I said, that's a great idea. We probably will. I said, but, but we're probably at least 20 years away from, from that. And she kind of laughed. She says, it's not going to take that long. And I said, oh, honey. Uh, it, it very well may. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Therefore, of course, this applies to the book of Ecclesiastes. The depth of insight, the stark observations, even the agonizing wrestlings serve as a corrective to the quick fix and upbeat theological tendencies of the modern church. Now, even at River Oaks, we can fall in love with sound bites and bullet points. But the fact is, all truth is not tweetable. Ecclesiastes provides hope for the person who, who looks around and is prompted to ask very hard questions about God because of the pain that he sees and because of the pain that he feels. Ecclesiastes will 
also challenge those of us who try to figure everything out, who diligently plan and then attempt to control the details of our lives to engineer the outcome that we think is best. But like the the great theologian Mike Tyson once said, (laughs) planning and preparation is great until you get punched in the face. And then it's on. (laughs) Another reason to study Ecclesiastes is that it's an example of the genre called wisdom literature, like Job and Psalms and Proverbs and Song of Songs or Song of Solomon. Now, we try to preach and read through different portions of Scripture over time, both from the Old Testament and the New. So simultaneously this morning, we are beginning reading through the Epistle of Romans In the New Testament, at the very same time, we are beginning to preach through the book of Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament. And we think that's a great thing to do because you don't need to be a biblical scholar to read those two books and say, "Mm, they're not exactly the same. Teaching different genres helps mature our thinking because it gives us a different perspective on familiar truths. Now, I've had the opportunity to drive in, to drive a car in two foreign countries, Guatemala and in Kenya. And Keith, you're smiling at me because you know you were with me in Guatemala, right? Now, both of these were interesting experiences. In Guatemala, the streets were narrow, The hills were steep. All of the transitions were manual. And there were people everywhere. Now, I've driven in Chicago a fair amount, right? So I'm used to the chaos. But it was essentially the same as driving here. A cool experience, just very overly stimulating continuously. In Kenya, however... When I went there with our team that goes every summer, uh, Pastor Julius' son, Gibran, asked me when, I, I think we were at a national park, he asked me, hey, would you like to drive my car from where we were at this one location over to the main office? And I said, sure, sounds cool, sounds great. Everything about his car is the same as the states. Steering wheel's on the same side, just like a vehicle in the U.S., In this case, the road was wide open. It was a dirt road, and we were pretty much in the middle of nowhere. What was fascinating to me is how disorienting this experience was for one reason. Kenyans drive on the left side of the street, right? This one simple fact changed everything for me. As I was driving down the road and I saw another car approaching, I didn't trust any of my instincts. In fact, I pretty much had to stop, come to almost a complete stop until the car passed me because it was so disorienting for me. And Gibran just kept laughing every time I did that. He said, you drive like my grandmother. And I said, we'd probably say the same joke in the States. That's pretty funny, actually. Here's the point. Same type of car same general rules, same direction. But the difference in perspective from the left side of the street was so different and disorienting for me, it took me a while to adjust. Now, reading wisdom literature can be a lot like that. Same Bible, same truths, same general theological direction, But the perspective is sometimes so noticeably different, it may take us a little while to adjust. Now, Ecclesiastes will reveal the glory of Jesus. We just may be seeing it from the other side of the road. Now, we need to make several important interpretive 
decisions in order to rightly understand the book of Ecclesiastes. And I've told a few different people that this, I think this is the most important introduction to a book that I've ever done because the perspectives on Ecclesiastes are so varied. Let's begin our look at the key interpretive decisions by considering authorship. Now, there's not a definitive consensus on this question, as there usually isn't, given modern scholarship. But historically, authorship has been ascribed to Solomon. And the more time I spend in this book, the more I think that is absolutely correct. Some believe that Solomon wrote Song of, Song of Solomon as a young man, Proverbs kind of in middle age, and then Ecclesiastes later in life. That certainly fits well with the themes of those books. Ecclesiastes feels like sage wisdom from a man who has seen a lot of things, experienced a lot of things, and thought about a lot of things. If it is Solomon, then the wisdom distilled from this book is 3,000 years old. If you are a person who feels like you're constantly battling competing emotions, or if you're a person who thinks carefully about the world, but it just leaves you sometimes wanting to cry, or if you have experienced or are experiencing a level of agony that sometimes just leaves you spiritually confused. The truth is, Solomon's words may shake you, but they also have the power to shape you into a person who is more able to trust in the one true God. Now, I want to spend a little bit of time unpacking the case for Solomon as the author because I think it has significant implications for the weight of the message that Ecclesiastes presents. Chapter 1 and verse 1 says, The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. In verses 12 and 13, later in chapter 1, the author writes, I, the preacher, have been king over Israel in Jerusalem. And I applied my heart to seek and to search out wisdom, to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. Later in chapter 1 and verse 16, he says, I said in my heart, I have acquired great wisdom, surpassing all who were over Jerusalem before me, and my heart has had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. Now, of course, there were only two kings before Solomon, David and Saul. But there were many, many people who led Jerusalem before those men. Chapter 2 and verse 9. After describing incredible excesses in terms of wealth and women and work, the author says, So I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also, my wisdom remained with me. An incredible statement. Ecclesiastes 8.2. I say, keep the king's command because of God's oath to him. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean it's Solomon, but it sure fits. There are multiple references to the king in chapter 10 of Ecclesiastes. And then finally, in chapter 12, in verses 9 and 10, we read, Besides being wise, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with great care. The preacher sought to find words of delight, and uprightly he wrote words of truth. So there are multiple specific references within Ecclesiastes that fit well with Solomon's life and his authorship. Recall, 1 Kings 3. Here the Lord appears to Solomon in a dream, Solomon in a dream, and tells Solomon, basically, ask me for whatever you want. And he famously 
asks for wisdom, which entirely pleases the Lord. The Lord specifically said to him, Behold, I give you a wise and discerning mind, so that none like you has been before you, and none like you shall arise after you. 1 Kings 3.12 Just let, let that reality fall onto you for a moment. Later, the queen of Sheba, who probably was a queen, perhaps in Ethiopia, But given the gifts that she brought Solomon, she herself was an extraordinarily powerful and wealthy woman. She travels to Jerusalem to see for herself the rumors that she had heard of Solomon's wealth and of his wisdom. 1 1 Kings 10 says, When the queen of Sheba had seen all the wisdom of Solomon and the house that he built, the food of his table, the seating of his officials, and the attendance of his servants, their clothing, his cupbearers, and his burnt offerings that he offered of the Lord, the text says it left her breathless. This powerful And wealthy woman was literally in awe of Solomon's wealth and Solomon's wisdom. She said that the reality was greater than the rumors. Therefore, biographically speaking, as we walk through Ecclesiastes, this book fits Solomon like a well-tailored suit. Think about this. How wise of God to have the wisest, richest, and in some ways the most prolific man that had ever lived. How wise of God to have him write this specific book. How powerful then do his words resonate with us when we know this is his story, when we can read his words, and yet he essentially says, But what was the point? It didn't bring ultimate satisfaction. It couldn't even bring me sustainable joy. That's an incredible statement, given the one who made it. If you would describe yourself as a a hard-driving, kind of locked-in, easily bored next thrill up, type A type. Solomon's words in this book will resonate with you. And they might rattle you. But his words also have the power to redirect your passions onto God himself. Now, the next important interpretive decision relates to the structure of the book. We need to decide as we read through it, what are we actually reading? It affects how we view the book and how we understand the book. Is it a variety of Jewish proverbs just pulled together into one document? And people argue strongly for each one of the options that I'm going to list. Is it primarily a treatise on secular philosophy? Is it a comparison with with two separate voices describing the meaninglessness of nihilism versus the purposefulness of theism? In other words, should the negative perspectives that are offered in the book perhaps be thought of like the dialogue of Job's friends, for example? Over and against the clear-headed faith of Job. But in this case, we're talking about the convictional faith of the preacher himself. One man compared reading Ecclesiastes to attempting to control an octopus. Right, the image explains itself. As soon as you think you have all of the tentacles 
under control. That is that you've, you've understood the book. You look over and <laughs> there's still one over there waving its hand in the air saying, hey, you haven't figured me out yet. But I think Ecclesiastes is not as confusing as it may initially seem. It is made up of several observations about various aspects of life. But all of the observations serve a very cohesive purpose which describe the difficulty of of fully grasping all that is happening in the world. This guy's not a pessimist. This guy's not a fatalist. This guy is a hardcore realist with a very firm God-centered orientation. The Hebrew word kohelet, or in Greek, Ecclesiastes, is the word translated preacher. It literally means one who speaks to an assembly. Therefore, both based on the content and structure of the book and because of its title, I think Ecclesiastes is essentially more like a singular message, perhaps addressed to a very specific gathering of people, much like a sermon. Ecclesiastes is basically constructed with a a very powerful opening proclamation. Vanity of vanities says the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. That's quite the attention grabber for an opening to a sermon. Is it not? You can almost see the preacher saying, now that I have your attention, follow my logic. After the opening proclamation, a premise is applied, that specific premise is applied to multiple observations. It's probed with provocative questions and it's driven to a very concise conclusion. If that's true, then the question that arises is, how might we summarize the message of this book? This is our final, very important interpretive decision. What is the message of Ecclesiastes? Now that is a complicated question that will take us 18 weeks to unpack. But I want to offer a clear answer right now. Because I want our time in Ecclesiastes to feel more like a guided tour than just kind of aimless wandering as we try to figure out what the preacher is talking about. So let me me first offer a summary of what I think the book is about and then take time to explain to you why I think this is right. One man described Ecclesiastes essentially as a commentary on life outside the Garden of Eden. There's chaos abounding. I think the message of Ecclesiastes can be summarized like this, and I have thought long and hard about this and read multiple summaries. I think the preacher is saying, life can be extremely frustrating because it can't be fully comprehended or controlled. But God has designed this world so that our pleasure and our pain, our excitement and our exasperation, the things that cause us to marvel, and even life's monotony, all direct us to find our ultimate fulfillment in God. Now, as I was putting that together, I have a reason for every phrase that I included in 
this summary. I'll talk about a lot of them right now, and then we'll unpack the rest of it over 18 weeks. The key to understanding the message rests primarily on our interpretation of the key phrase or phrases of the book. The word hevel, which is a Hebrew word, is used 38 times in Ecclesiastes. Most literally, it means breath or mist or vapor or kind of a, a wisp of air. But hevel is a word that is very context dependent. In other words, the content pulls out the nuances of the way that the word is used. Hevel can mean vain, futile, meaningless, irrational, senseless, temporary, fleeting, mysterious, incomprehensible, ungraspable, enigmatic. Now, you can tell from, from, from my description that I tend more towards the mysterious or incomprehensible, the ungraspable, the ungraspable, the enigmatic end of the spectrum. Now, all of the definitions, all of them have contextual meaning and the nuances are found in Ecclesiastes and we'll see that as we walk through the book. However, I believe that the all-encompassing nature of the key phrase most naturally fits the idea of life under the sun not being fully graspable in terms of meaning. Now, just a little bit of historical background. The reason that vanity of vanities has come all the way forward into even our, our modern translations is because that's the way Jerome translated the Vulgate in Latin in 400 AD. And so Tyndale just kind of adopted his translation of the word hevel. And that is kind of carried through. But I'd like us to just kind of wipe the hard drive on that. I deeply respect history and these ideas, but I, I want us to think freshly about the idea. What I'm arguing is that the preacher is saying, all is hevel. Everything is hevel. Life can sometimes be frustratingly incomprehensible as we seek to make sense of what God is doing. Now, the reason that I'm describing it that way is because I think the case is bolstered by the second really key phrase that's used in Ecclesiastes. This phrase is used seven different times. So look at chapter 1 and verse 14 with me. I have seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, all is hevel. A striving after the wind. Now, this second phrase is absolutely fascinating. And I think it, in many ways, provides the key to rightly understanding the main point of the book and then the book as a whole. It essentially means, this phrase, a striving after the wind, essentially means an attempt to, to corral or to grasp or to control, or to direct the wind. Its root, in Hebrew, is the root word for shepherd. So in essence, what he's saying is, life is like trying to shepherd, or the imagery that comes to mind right away is, is a shepherd kind of corralling his sheep, right? Life is kind of like a shepherd trying to corral or to guide the wind, Imagine how frustrating that would be. Even Jesus said, look, the wind blows whatever it wants to, right? When he was talking to Nicodemus. Now, he may also have said, but Nicodemus, I'm sovereign, and so it actually does whatever I command it to, but for you, you have no ability to control the wind, right? Picture, picture a shepherd kind of driving his sheep across the road, right? 
a skilled shepherd we kind of are in awe of because of the way that animals and sheep in particular are. We say, hey, that's impressive. But I mean, we would laugh hard if we saw a shepherd trying to move sheep across the road and it was just not going well, right? But this is the idea, this is the imagery that the preacher is using in this particular sermon. This is what life can be like. Maddening. Like trying to corral the wind. Now, there are multiple places where some of the other definitions... The interpretations like meaninglessness, where they don't fit, where they don't work. There will be some where it fits very naturally and nicely. But remember what his phrase is. Everything, everything, all is heaven. Well, if everything is, then what's the best way of understanding that? The reason meaningless doesn't work is because he compares one thing as better than another thing multiple times as we walk through the book. There are other times when he describes how long and repetitious life can seem, which is anything but fleeting. Now, we'll talk about the specific examples when we get there in the book. But the meaning that seems to pull everything together in an overarching way, that seems to fit most consistently throughout, is the idea of life not being able to be fully grasped or understood. Like picture trying to get a hold of the smoke that's coming up from a candle. It would be maddeningly frustrating, right, if you were trying to do that. We just can't quite grasp sometimes what God is doing in the world when certain things happen or even within our own lives. It seems so futile or meaningless or purposeless. Hundreds of Christians killed on resurrection morning just a couple weeks ago. What about when our marriage is so hard? What about when friends just walk away from us? What about when children walk away from the faith? That cuts to the deepest places of our hearts. That's when we can say with blood earnestness, life can be extremely frustrating because it can't be fully corralled. You get the imagery? That is, it can't be fully comprehended or controlled. But God has designed this world so that our pleasure and our pain, our excitement and our exasperation, the things that cause us to marvel, and even life's monotony all direct us to find our ultimate fulfillment in God himself. In him, that which is fleeting prepares us for everlasting fulfillment. In him, peace is possible even in the experience of immense pain. In him, earthly pleasures become appetizers of everlasting joy. In him, the insignificant becomes sacred. Even a cup of cold water offered in my name. In him, unrelenting repetition ends in unmerited reward. The frustrating reality of not being able to fully grasp the essence of life or to completely control its outcomes rather than leading to despair become daily opportunities to demonstrate faithful dependence upon God. The words of the preacher in Ecclesiastes reveal that all of the complexities of life under the sun lead to a stunningly simple conclusion. We just read it. At the beginning of our sermon, all of life's answers are ultimately found in him. That is in the one true shepherd, in God himself. Now what is fascinating about the phrase, shepherding the wind, is that it, it therefore embeds shepherding imagery throughout the sermon. Which brings a cohesion to the overall message, which we'll see as we walk through it. And it makes the preacher's final point 
all the more powerful. As frustrating as life can be, because we can't fully grasp what God is doing. It's just like trying to corral the wind. Like a shepherd corrals his sheep. Think of the words of chapter 12 now. The words of the wise are like goads, which is basically a shepherd's staff, or the stick that he uses to guide his sheep across the road. Therefore, we're not left in chaos in this world because the text says, like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings of one shepherd. Do you see where he's leading us? Do you see the message of the book beginning to take shape? At the end of the day, or as he puts it, the preacher puts it, the end of the matter is this. Fear God and keep his commandments, commandments because he has all the answers. He has all the answers that we can't figure out. And he is the one, ultimately, that we are so desperately longing for. Now, let's apply the rest of the Bible to the book of Ecclesiastes. Everything in life points to one shepherd. Any guesses on who that might ultimately be? Jesus himself said, I am the good shepherd. And Paul said, in whom are found all the riches of wisdom and knowledge, Colossians 2.3. This is the answer to the question, where is Jesus in Ecclesiastes? Jesus is the final fulfillment of all the longings expressed by the preacher of Ecclesiastes. Jesus is the redeemer of all of the preacher's disappointment and his disillusion. What makes this truth so mind-bending is when we remember the identity of the preacher himself. Solomon. Which is why I think authorship is such a key to this particular book. Solomon, the son of David, the first fulfillment of the Davidic covenant, the very first in the line of the descendants of David that God promised would sit on his throne. So think about it in terms of wisdom, in terms of wealth, in terms of women, in terms of work. Solomon, the son of David, may have been the most fulfilled man who ever lived. And yet, he left longing for something. For someone more fulfilling. Yearning for someone that would be eternally satisfying. According to 1 Kings, he was the wisest man who ever lived. Yet he found himself utterly exasperated, trying to corral, to comprehend, to control the meaning and outcomes of life. And at the end of the day, he was left to declare everything is hevel. A futile attempt to shepherd or to corral the wind. He didn't know it. But Solomon found himself longing for David's greater son. The good shepherd. A man whose wisdom and fame would far surpass his own. A man who fills all in all, Ephesians 1.23, a man from whose fullness we have all received grace upon grace, John 1.16. Ultimately, Solomon surveyed everything under the sun and concluded that he and everyone else needed to look to one shepherd, the good shepherd, in whom every one of God's promises is yes and amen. As we transition now to communion, considered 
Consider that the good shepherd is the one who Paul says became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption. 1 Corinthians 1, 30. How did Jesus, the good shepherd, become these things for us? How did he become our redemption? John 10, 11 reveals the reality that makes it all possible. Here Jesus said, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Which brings us to the very sacrifice that is imaged before us this morning. The good news of the gospel is that Jesus bore all of the brokenness of this world onto himself. And in particular, this table, the table before you, represents the great exchange of our sin for the impeccable righteousness of Jesus Christ. Therefore, the way that things will work this morning is that we'll come up through the middle aisles and grab the elements, return to the aisles on the outside. You need not be a member of River Oaks Community Church in order to participate in this this table of grace. You do, however, have needed to have repented of your sin and placed your faith in Jesus Christ, God's Son, the Good Shepherd, as the reason that you are righteous in His sight. But if that's true for you, even if that became true for you this very morning, then you are welcome to come to this table of grace. Further, we ask that you be in right standing with your own local church if you're visiting with us this morning. And if you're not sure exactly what that means or whether or not you are, then I'll be up at the front on one of the sides. I'm happy to talk with you about that. Let me pray for us and then you'll be able to come to celebrate together in just a moment. Lord, we love you so much. And we are in awe of the revelation of your word and of who Jesus is and what he has done. Would you now move by your spirit to convict us of sin, to console us with the good news of the gospel, and to move our hearts to rejoice because of who Jesus is and because of what he has accomplished. Please, as we continue in worship, would you lead us now by your spirit, I ask. In Jesus' name, amen.